Uh, well, it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, the last Association of Physicians meeting I came to, I think, was about 16 years ago. And um, a particular pleasure to deliver the Osler lecture. Osler, of course, was instrumental in much of what we see as, uh, as um, modern medicine. And uh, I was interested that when he left his post in Philadelphia in 1883, he gave uh, a lecture in which he described the characteristics uh, that the doctor needed. And he said, um, in, in, uh, being imperturbable, imper, imper, I'm not going to get it right now. Imper, impertability was important. So calm amongst the storm. He also said equanimity was important. He said that having a moderation of emotion and tolerance was important. And I was thinking about those two characteristics as I look back on my five years as government chief scientific advisor with uh, four prime ministers, six chancellors, seven secretaries of state, and 10 science ministers. And I thought, actually, they're not bad characteristics to look for in a chief scientific advisor either. <laughs> so uh, Osler, I think, remains relevant to all sorts of areas. Um, I'm going to talk about government, but I'm going to start by talking about personal experiences in academia and industry, and I'm going to try and bring those things together. So let me, let me um, start by uh, what actually made me interested in research, and it was an observation that uh, uh, Robert first got made when actually he was well into retirement. And he made an observation that if you take a, a, a blood vessel from a rabbit, it would relax to acetylcholine, only if the endothelium was intact. And if you damage the endothelium, it wouldn't relax any longer. And he described endothelium-dependent relaxation and said there is a diffusible factor which causes that relaxation of the smooth muscle. And I was interested in the question, well, is that relevant to human blood vessels and human disease? And the ability to look at that more became possible because the substance was identified as nitric oxide and an inhibitor of nitric oxide synthase was available that then allowed us to probe those mechanisms in people and indeed found that that was relevant to human uh, blood vessels and in, that blood vessels, particularly arterioles, are actively dilated by the release of nitric oxide and if you block that, they constrict and blood pressure goes up. And that led to all sorts of other uh, experiments and approaches and for many years, I was interested in uh, the cellular consequences of that. And when I left academia after 20 years as a clinician and an academic, I put together a slide to try and introduce myself to my next role, which was going to be in industry. And I realised that essentially I'd become expert in nothing um, because I'd moved across a number of different technologies in order to try and answer questions. So whether that was the original one of um, trying to look at blood flow in the forearm through to imaging, animal experiments, structural biology, chemistry, using large electronic databases to try and answer questions, including health records. And it made me think that one of the advantages of academia is you can follow your nose, and you can follow your nose to the question, and the question trumps individual technologies. It doesn't sit within the bounds of individual technologies. So a big advantage and an important part of academia is the ability to follow your curiosity, is the ability to work with many other colleagues who are expert in different disciplines, and this has come up several times during this meeting, this notion of interdisciplinarity and building across disciplines to answer questions, and keeping the problem central. What is it you're trying to understand? Well, I moved from academia into industry, and um, I learned a lot in industry. I learned a lot about um, large-scale research, about the ability to turn ideas into products, about the complexities of things that you often don't think about in academia, including how do you actually manufacture something, and how do you keep quality control to the right level. But in R&D, there are, I think, four key questions. And they're sort of obvious, but they are the key questions in making a medicine. What do you want to make the medicine against? What is the target you're trying to address, and why is that your target? Once you make that decision, we know historically you've got a 97% chance of failing. In other words, you're only right very few times to get right the way through to the end. The second big question is, 
what molecule, and it's normally a molecule, but it needn't be, it could be a gene therapy, a cell therapy, or something else, but what is the thing that is your drug product? The third is, how do you actually know, once you've got it, that it's doing what you want to? What's the clinical experiment that tells you, yes, I am indeed disrupting the thing I think I'm supposed to be disrupting? And the fourth is, how do you demonstrate this clinical value at scale with large clinical trials. Those, I think, are the four key decisions in making a medicine. The molecule one's interesting because the moment you've picked your molecule or gene construct or whatever it is, you have essentially enshrined in that physical structure all the promise, all the hope, all the despair. You can't go back. You've made that decision. But the one that's obviously highly relevant to this meeting is the third of these and often isn't done well enough, which is what's the clinical experiment I can do that tells me I'm actually on track. I've picked the right thing. This molecule does look like it's going to do what I want it to do. And that, I think, is an area that still needs a lot of attention in industry. The target one's interesting, and it picks up on many of the talks that you've had in this meeting and some of the ones we've just heard about, which is the massive advance in really being able to link genomics to phenotypics is crucial, and it means that the ability to pick a target is very different now from what it was 10 or 20 years ago. You have a much stronger idea of causal relationships. So these, these four areas remain, I think, central to um, making a drug. And, and one of the frustrations of heading a large R&D organization is it takes a decade to know whether you are right. But one of the advantages of that is when you've left an organization, you get a deferred either gratification or misery because you find out whether you were right or wrong. And last year, I was uh, pleased that a couple of things came through, which were rather um, nice to see because they'd been a long time in the making. And one of these um, on the left-hand side was an antibiotic. And, and as you know, the whole question of uh, antimicrobial resistance is a major one across the world, and the number of new antibiotics is low, and a new class of antibiotics hasn't been, um, hasn't been seen for 25-plus years. And we pursued um, a TOPO isomerase inhibitor uh, in bacteria, and um, uh, this drug, Jepatitazin, was the one that um, we kept going despite a lot of opposition within the company to do it. And I was absolutely delighted towards the end of last year to see that uh, finally, when this got into phase three clinical trials, the trials were stopped because it was so effective. So there are new antibiotics coming along. It is possible to make new antibiotics, and it is possible to make antibiotics against brand new targets. The other one that, that, that um, pleased me last year was actually um, on the right-hand uh, side of the slide, which was um, when we were making HIV drugs and um, we were trying to make integrase inhibitors, and indeed um, the first molecule went through became dolotegravir, which is a very important anti-HIV medicine. But the second one um, had a very odd set of characteristics. And I remember well um, somebody coming up to me at our research site in Raleigh, Durham in, in the USA and saying, this drug has a very, very long half-life. When we've done the studies in um, people, it lasts for, and that slide, you can't read the axis, but it lasts for 46 weeks following a single infection, uh, injection. And we thought, well, that's you know, not the property you normally want in a drug, but could it be possible that you could use this in a different way? And the idea was that you could have an injectable drug for HIV that you'd only have to give three times a year. Or you'd have an injectable drug which would prevent HIV. And, and the panel on the right shows the effects when you looked in primates. And um, uh, in eight primates who were given the drug, you couldn't infect them with HIV. And in the eight that were, weren't given the drug, all eight got infected with HIV. So it's a very effective drug, very long half-life. And this notion of having an injectable drug for HIV which seemed really bizarre at the time, the idea that you could have needles anywhere near anyone with HIV, had absolutely no traction at all with a commercial organisation, and we had to push very hard. And I was delighted to see that this drug works unbelievably well for HIV prevention and um, is now something that WHO think should be used much more widely, which is always our idea that this could be used, for example, in high-risk 
populations, high-risk sex workers in South Africa, and actually prevent infection. So those are two sort of nice deferred gratification stories. By the way, they're not always like that. You normally look and think, oh my God, that failed. Um, but but those, two, those two worked. So after a time in industry, and, and what would the lesson be from industry? Well, the lesson from industry is you need massive teams of people, you need multidisciplinarity again, engineers become incredibly important in the whole process, and you need to be patient. I decided after this to move to government. And um, the government chief scientific advisor role, I didn't know that much about, and I, I went to uh, take advice from Gus O'Donnell, who was a previous cabinet secretary. And um, from that lunch, uh, two things remain with me, one of which I, remain very, uh, I remember very well and one of which Gus O'Donnell remembers very well. And the thing that I remember well is I said to Gus, what do you think of science in government? And he said, well, it's good in parts and um, it's a bit variable across government. It can come into its own at certain times and it isn't as embedded in government as, for example, economics is. He said, if you think about every department has economics absolutely as part of a decision-making process, that's not true for science. He said, but it wasn't true for economics 50 years ago. They were odd. They were odd people in the, in the department off to one side who occasionally got brought in to say something. He said, you should try and make science in government as embedded as economics is, as integral to policy and thinking as economics is. So that's the one that I took and said, yes, I'm going to try and do that. The one that he remembers is I asked him, do I need to worry at all about any media in this? He said, no, you don't have any media. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that, I think, haunts him to this day. Um, if you think about government and the sorts of things that government has to deal with, I challenge you to think of a single area of policy or operations where science, engineering, and innovation couldn't make a difference. Literally every single department. So whether it's how we think about our food supply in the UK and our food security, whether we think about the way we design cities, whether we insulate our houses and how we do it, how we design our houses, how we create homes that are buildings that are appropriate. Our energy supply, of course our health. Our communication with each other, the defence of the nation, our travel around the nation, and our communications at all levels all require input. So every single department requires science and technology as part of its thinking. If you move to defence, security, resilience, it's very clear that that's dependent on science and technology. And the picture at the bottom there is one of the ones that um, occurred on my watch, which was um, the potential collapse of Todbrook Dam, if you remember that. Huge engineering challenges, huge issues around what water flow would be following a collapse of a dam, what the implications would be for vital services, and where the expertise was to try and answer some of those questions. And, and the final thing is, if you think about the economy, seven out of ten of the world's biggest uh, companies are basically science and technology companies, and they grow faster than other companies. And if you look at the relationship between total spend on R&D in a country and growth, there is a positive relationship. So if you want to have an economy that grows, you've got to have very good science and technology. So you put all that together and say it's involved in everything, it's important for security and resilience, and it's important for growth, it reinforces this view that it ought to be something that government cares about deeply and is good at. So... My first question was, is government good at it? And we undertook a review which is published in 2019 called the Science Capability Review, just to try and ask some questions about what science was like in government. Science budgets, we found, had decreased over a decade, and they'd been disproportionately decreased compared to other budgets. And in some departments, the spend on R&D was a fraction of 1% of the total spend. Now, if you were a company and you said, I choose to spend a fraction of 1% of what I do on R&D, you've effectively declared yourself to be a no-growth commodity company. So that's a problem. 
departments weren't clear about why they had science in their department or indeed how they organised it or what the leadership was. The resources to people who were scientists in governments weren't as strong as they should be. And the public sector research establishments, of which there are 70 or 80 dotted around the nations, were variable. Some were outstanding, like the Met Office and the um, uh, National Physical Laboratory. Others were somewhat neglected. But perhaps more striking than that, of the 1,200 people on the fast streams, that's the graduate scheme uh, for the civil service, 24 were on a science and engineering fast stream. Of the 400 on the generalist, generalist fast stream, so these are the, the, these are the future permanent sectors and leaders of the civil service, of the 400 on the generalist fast stream, 45 had a STEM degree. So massive skewing towards non-STEM bias in the civil service can't be right. I don't know what the right number is. I know what we've managed to get it to now, which is 50% target, and that feels about okay to me. It shouldn't be 90%, but it shouldn't be 10% or 11%. So a lot's happened to try and improve this. Budgets are better. There's a chief scientific advisor in every department. There are structures in departments, and we've got targets for uh, fast streamers, and there are better resources. So yes, government science is in a somewhat better place. But of course, government can only be good at science if there are other things that are true as well. And one of the things that has to be true is academic science and foundational science, as I put it, needs to be good. Where are we in that? Well, by any measure, we're world class. So we have three or four of the top 10 universities in the world. We have uh, less than 1% of the population, but 14% of the world's most highly cited uh, publications. And funding has increased. So we've got a good base, but, and, uh, and Paul Nurse has pointed this out recently, we absolutely should not be complacent about that. Many other countries are moving very fast to increase their funding, and we're standing a bit still in places. So there is a risk there that we shouldn't take any of that for granted, but we have outstanding science base. What about industry? Well, we have some big industries. We have aerospace, we have pharmaceuticals, we have uh, a number of other sectors where we have quite good R&D uh, base, but a lot is changing in terms of startups. And we have a good startup situation in the UK compared to the rest of Europe. We're not as good as the US, but there are some quite striking differences. Um, on the left-hand side, it's the uh, number of venture capital deals in so-called deep tech companies. So companies really focus on developing the technologies. And the numbers baselined against um, uh, um, the start is roughly, uh, roughly the same growth rate in the UK, Europe, and US. But if you look on the right-hand side, what's the average deal size? Europe and the UK are so much lower than the US, and that's a, that's a problem. So if I try and summarise where I think the, the sort of industrial situation is, we've got some big companies in some sectors with a lot of R&D. We've got a good startup scene. We undercapitalize. We're not growing those startups as well, and we know we've got a problem with growth of those companies into sustainable companies. So putting the whole thing together, government getting better but a lot to do academia good place but vulnerable industry good in parts failure to scale and get to lots more of the sorts of companies we're going to need and there are some things that need to happen to get that right so those are things which any government needs to worry about and i want to give two resilience examples as to how this matters and the first is obvious which is covid on January the 3rd, 2020, I was away and I sent a message back to the Government Office for Science to say, I don't like what I'm hearing about what's going on in Wuhan. Can you activate the SAGE mechanism and start thinking about whether we need to call a meeting at some point to understand what's happening? And during January, we had a number of meetings without calling a formal SAGE meeting till the end of January, but we started to look at the needs and in particular what the research needs were together with the research funding agencies and um, Wellcome Trust was part of that as well as the government funding agencies. 
And we looked at a number of areas from social science through to virology, epidemiology and others, and we looked in relation to vaccines. But the foundational science base of the country was crucial to be able to do that. It was easy to get experts because we got lots of them around the university. It was relatively easy to do certain things. So if you think about the sequencing of viral genomes, throughout most of 2020, the UK was contributing 50% of the viral genomes for the whole world because we were good at it. So if you're good at something, you're able to activate it. So activating the COG UK uh, program, bringing together sequencing around the UK to apply it to this was something led effectively by Sharon Peacock that actually made a difference. Getting up clinical trials was possible because we're good at clinical trials and we do them. And the Oxford group did an amazing job of getting the recovery study going. So that ability to bring together academics, people who are really expert from academia, from foundational science was crucial for the ability to make some sort of response and planning for COVID. What about industry? Well, we got vaccines because we had an industrial base that allowed us to bring experts into the system. You don't get the vaccines just from the academic work. You have to have industry involved. We were able to do things with therapeutics because of an experience of industry in therapeutics in the UK. And we were much less good at getting diagnostics scaled because we didn't really have a diagnostics industry in the UK. So that industrial base is actually quite an important part of resilience and how you can plan right the way across uh, different emergencies. And there were examples that you wouldn't necessarily expect. So when we wanted to do a survey to find out what was happening with the spread of infection across the population, it was not possible to do that with Public Health England because they were stretched far <laughs> too thin. Eventually, the Office for National Statistics said, we'll do it. But it turned out they couldn't do it because they didn't have the workforce to be able to do it. So I remember that um, uh, um, the head of one of the contract research organisations that exists in the UK to support um, industry had said to me, all of our people aren't doing anything because you've stopped all the clinical trials apart from those that exist in, in, uh, for COVID. They're twiddling their thumbs. So I phoned him up and said, if all your people are twiddling their thumbs, could they actually take part in a survey the ONS wants to do and go and knock on doors and actually help people get samples? He said yes, and then it took a few weeks to get it sorted out because it turned out it wasn't as easy as he thought it was to do that. But they did do it, and we could only do that because of industrial science base in the UK. If you didn't have it, you wouldn't have been able to do it. And right the way through COVID, my colleagues in other countries would say, I wish we had something like the, co the ONS survey. And my answer was, well, you could. you just got to set it up. But we couldn't have done it if we didn't have both government science in the ONS and the industrial science and the academic science that led some of the thinking behind that. And then the third part is the government part. Well, Public Health England got extremely stretched because of their um, insufficient scientific base at that moment, I think, um, but was important throughout. The MHRA was important throughout. The Office for National Statistics was important throughout. The government laboratories were able to come in and help with a number of things from a different areas, including from the animal and plant health agency, from many of the organizations that had sequencing capacity. So that integration of academic, industrial, and government science was crucial throughout the response. And there are things that take you by surprise. And Part of government science, which I absolutely did not think would be important, and I only learned about recently, and it wasn't important during the COVID um, pandemic, but it may be important for the future, was when I was at the Natural History Museum and I got shown the bat collection. <laughs> and as you might expect, there's somebody who's deeply enthusiastic about bats who leads that. And he said to me, we wondered if we could take a sample from our very old collections and whether we could detect coronavirus if we took a needle aspirate. And sure enough, he could, connect, he could pick up sequence of coronavirus in bats stored 120 years ago. 
And he got together with his mates across the other natural history museums, and they're doing a survey now to see if they can look at the evolution of coronavirus in bats from, from collections from 100, 150 years ago. What an extraordinary thing. You know, the people who collected those bats could have had no concept that they could be used for that, which then gave me a very, very unpleasant moment of thinking, what is it we should be doing today in a museum like that that in 150 years' time people are going to say, thank God they collected that, even though they didn't know why they were collecting it. So unexpected things happen from just supporting science. If COVID is an example of resilience and how you use it in an emergency, it also turned out to be a growth story in the sense that the response, particularly the formation of the Vaccines Task Force, which brought together industry, academia and government, meant that the industry started to invest more in the UK. And we heard a bit about that this morning, I think, in, in a question somebody asked about uh, vaccine infrastructure in the UK and what's happening. That is a growth story because of the way it was possible to respond. The other great uh, emergency which all governments face that's going to be much longer lasting and much more difficult than the pandemic is, of course, the climate crisis. And exactly the same three things matter. Academia spotted the problem, described the problem, brought it to everyone's attention. It remains crucial for things like what is happening on um, the effects of climate, the extreme weather events, the rise in sea levels, the change in biodiversity as a result of climate. It's going to be important for understanding things like clouds. Clouds are actually very difficult to understand and they have a big impact in ways that people don't predict very well. Industry is going to be important because the solutions to this are going to be technological in part and scaled technology. You've got to get into every household. And government's going to be important because they've got to integrate this and make it happen right the way across the country and fund things for the future beyond 2050, like nuclear fusion, which only governments can really put enough resource in to make that happen at scale. So this trio of industry, academia, and government is crucial for pretty much any area of emergency you think of. And so that leads to two final points. Science isn't something that should be done off in one corner. It's for all of government, every department, and therefore it is a prime ministerial accountability. And one of the things we set up was a National Science and Technology Council chaired by the prime minister, the idea was to put it on the same footing as the National Security Council because an incoming Prime Minister is highly unlikely to say, you know what, we don't need a National Security Council. They should feel the same about National Science and Technology Council. And if they do want to not do that, they're going to have to make a positive statement now to say, I don't care about science and technology. They can't just do it by neglect. So this is a very important step. Um, uh, Boris Johnson was the first uh, Prime Minister to chair it. It had an interesting little period during Liz Truss's um, brief, uh, uh, <laughs> brief, brief time, and, and, uh, and Sunak is now chairing it, and I'm absolutely sure that the Labour Party, if they got in, would, would do this as well. So this is, I think, now, now a, a fixture, and it's important because it doesn't just sit in a single department. Department for Transport, Health, MOD, Housing all need to have science and technology. And my final point is um, these are really difficult problems, and difficult problems don't get solved by monolithic thinking or monolithic institutions. And so the fundamental nature of diversity in science is so crucial uh, to all of this and um, is often misunderstood as a sort of nice to have. It's not. It's a fundamental essential um, it's the only way we're going to get decent answers to problems. It's the only way we're going to get the right level of thinking across. And it's part of diversity from every aspect, including, of course, that integration of things that I've talked about and interdisciplinarity. So uh, thank you very much for your attention, and I'm happy to take questions.